Hello and welcome to C Programming for Everybody. I'm Charles Severance and I'm your professor for this course. In this lecture we are going to do a very rapid translation from Python to C. So as I've shown you in our earlier lectures, C is kind of like the mother tongue of advanced programming languages. Python itself was written and still is written in C. And Python is deeply influenced by C even though the syntax looks very different, right? Um, and if you've taken all my other classes, you will have seen PHP, you'll have seen uh, JavaScript, and to some degree even CSS takes some of its inspiration from uh, the syntax of C. And so I'm not intending for this to be your first programming class. I intend for you to be an expert in Python. Well, not expert, but certainly I'm not going to tell you what an if statement is. I'm not going to tell you what a variable is. I'm going to just tell you how to use variables in C, and I'm going to tell you how to use if statements in C. And so that's why a solid foundation of Python, not wizard, but solid foundation of Python is essential. And frankly, I would rather that you learned a bit of PHP, some JavaScript, and all this other stuff before you come. I see that C Pro I think a C programming is not the first class that you should take, but instead it is your gateway to the advanced work that you're going to do. And so I think C is very, very important. I just don't think it's your first programming class. So you might think Python and C are not very different, although Python is written in C. Python has white space that is part of its syntax. C white space is ignored. I, I do like C better in that. Python is very object-oriented. If you read an article I wrote on Quora, you'll see I, I rank all my languages and I, I put JavaScript and Python as the most object-oriented languages. Java is a little less object-oriented. And C is like the least unobject-oriented. C is not object-oriented at all. Python has wonderfully convenient data structures in the form of lists and dictionaries. PHP has arrays and um, JavaScript has objects. The all beautiful, beautiful stuff. They're very object-oriented structures. Python, a C does not. It's fast, it's efficient, it's powerful, it's got structs and pointers, and by golly, you will use them and they're not, they're not convenient, but they are scorchingly fast. And by the time we're done with all this, we will see how to use structs and pointers to build lists and dictionaries. And that really is, we will follow down the path of building Python. So you'll see a, a common th theme throughout this class of how Python achieves what it's trying to achieve by writing C. Python has automatic memory management to the point where if you've been a Python programmer, or a PHP programmer, or a Java programmer, or JavaScript programmer, you probably don't even know what memory management is. Well, you're going to by the end of this class. And by the end of this class, you're going to be able to see how Python automates memory management for you, right? Python is written in the 80s and C was written in the 70s. And in, in many ways, I see Python as a convenience layer that was built on top of C. Just C programmers look at C, it's like, it's great, it's great, it's great. If we just had this layer of easiness on top of it, then things would be better. And so um, that's what Python is. Now, Python also introduced things like quite different syntax to make it uh, indentation you know, required because they thought it was a good idea. So we, we could argue one way or the other. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you when I'm writing a million lines of code, I white white space is not to me a good way to have syntax. So we're going to look at C through a Python lens and we're going to learn by example. Now most of the time I tell you um, don't copy and paste, don't cheat, don't look for solutions. This lecture is the exception to that rule. I've written this lecture as a Rosetta Stone just a little tiny bit of connection to what you already know in Python to what you're going to do in C. And so I'm not intending at this point for you to build your own stuff based on reading a book. I actually just want you, and if I give you assignments to do these particular things, I really do want you to just watch this lecture, grab the PowerPoint, and feel free to cut and paste from my PowerPoint into my assignments. Because this is... I don't know if you've ever seen it where the mama tiger is teaching a baby tiger 
how to hunt and the mama tiger goes out and gets a something or other and brings it back and puts it near the baby tiger and lets the baby tiger chase it. Well, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm the mama tiger and I'm giving you some C code and I'm putting it right in front of you and then I want you to take that C code and I want you to run it and play with it and understand it. So I'm not expecting in this lecture that you're going to derive it, that you're going to sort of somehow read the textbook, look at a problem and solve the problem. That's later. That is, that's absolutely later. So this is the beginning. This is trying to make connections, conceptual connections to the complex knowledge you have about Python to little places where you can hook things onto in C. And so the idea is to go through it quickly. So I do assign some of these as programming exercises. It's intended for me, my intent is that you'll watch the lectures and just work on the code at the same time. I'm not trying to test what you learned. I really want you to watch and listen and type. That's how we learn, right? You could cut and paste it or you could type it and you could type it one piece at a time. And the mere act of you typing, even though you're just looking at a slide and typing it in, at this point in the course, that is the learning objective of this lecture. Now, that whole rule of just typing code in that you're looking at some from someone else, don't, don't do that forever. Later, I want you to do things like synthesize what you learn in the book, synthesize it, struggle through it, and figure things out and do the assignment yourself. So don't go searching if you want to gain maximum benefit. If you're just in the biggest hurry of all, just go ahead and search. But please, if you want benefit from this class, don't cheat yourself. There's a lot of similarities that I'm not going to cover. You can go read the textbook, like the plus, minus, asterisk, slash, and percent. Hey, probably when you were learning Python, you're like, whoa, what's this percent thing? And why did they choose percent? And the answer is, that's what C chose. And so modulo is just percent in all these other languages because they flipped a coin in C and decided percent was modulo. The comparison operators, the assignment operators equal sign, which means that the, the equality operators got to be double equals exclamation equals, less than, greater than, less than or equal, all that stuff's the same. Variable naming rules, the same. You start with a letter, underscore, and then numbers, letters, and underscores, and case matters, both languages. While loops, the concept of break and continue, which, you know, some people get all worried about. I love break and continue if you've taken my other courses, and you'll see when we talk about it in C, I love break and continue in C too. Maybe because that's I learned C first, and I, I just love breaking, and you uh, okay, enough about that. I love breaking. Ding, ding. Okay, enough about that. Uh, constants, uh, about the only thing that's really different in constants is like strings and characters and booleans. And strings and characters are like the biggest thing in the beginning. Both have int and float and char and byte. Now, th again, byte and string and char are not the same thing. C has no str class, which is the string class, list or dictionary. And Python has no concept of struct or double. And in a sense, you could think of um, Python's float is really C's double, right? And so by the time Python was written, the notion of shorter floating point numbers is less, less critical. There are some differences. A lot of this, I think, was in the design of Python trying to be a little less obtuse and a little more convenient. Uh, for me, it's annoying. I write the C versions of the operators like and, double ampersand, not as exclamation point, we call that bang, or double vertical bar. And in Python, they're all convenient. We use the word A-N-D, but okay, whatever. Um, so there in C, we have a for loop, but it's, it's an indeterminate loop. If you remember the definition from Python for everybody, an indeterminate loop is one that you have to examine to see if it's got an infinite loop. Whereas in, the, in Python, if you say for X in some list. You're going to go through the whole list. It's a determinant loop. It only runs until that list is exhausted. C does not have such a thing, right? It just, every loop has got a condition to finish it. Now we write loops like 4i equals 1 to 100 or 0 to 99. We write them and you can look at them and say, yeah, that's not an infinite loop. It's just technically you have to look at the loop to make sure that you haven't inadvertently made an infinite loop. There's no predefined true and false. I, I find this really like, wow, couldn't they? They got EOF, capital EOF for end of file in C. None and null are similar concepts, but quite different. None in Python is its own type. Null is the number zero. 
that's cast to be a pointer to nothing. And so none is like specially marked empty. Null is a zero. <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, strings and character arrays, for a while you can kind of pretend that character arrays in C are mostly like strings, like when you throw a constant and you pass it to a function, they kind of look the same. But like once we start working with them, you'll see they're very, very different. And that's that's kind of the first fun part of the first part of this class is like st strings are now your responsibility. There's no, <laughs> there's no help, right? Um, and C of course has no list or dictionary and Python has no concept of like tightly packed data, which is what structs are and, uh, and doubles and floats. So here we go. Let's get started. Let's see if my pen is working here. Yeah. So what we're going to see is on one side, we're going to see some Python. On another side, we're going to see some C. And so this is just talking about output. This is Python 3, of course. And so we have a print function and it takes any number of parameters. One of the things you'll notice about the print function is like hello space world. Well, that's part of this constant, but answer comma 42 puts a little space in between answer and 42 in the output. So if you want to suppress that kind of automatic addition of spacing, you have to have maybe concatenate things together or, or some other trick. Um, the print statement automatically knows if it's got a string or a float or an integer and it just does things kind of all automatically. And so if you want to see something, usually you just print it, okay? So let's take a look at the uh, compare and contrast. So first off, you pretty much are going to have to start every one of your C programs with pound includes standard io.h. Comments are different. Python comments are pound sign to the end of the line. Uh, C comments are slash star across multiple lines to star slash. So everything in between there, that can be multiple lines. Later versions of C also add the, what's called the C++ style of comments in the JavaScript, uses those as comments, which is the double slash. So when you're writing, you probably can use double slash in the C that you're using, but I'm kind of being kind of strict, and so I'm pretending I'm in 1978, so I'm not using that uh, C++ style comment. Again, that came from C++, it didn't come from JavaScript. Some of you have taken Python classes where there's this like underscore underscore main and it calls this thing and it makes a function and calls it and indents everything one tab. And they're really imitating C in that respect. And I think, I don't like that style. I think those people who do that in C, Python, I'm sure they have a good reason, but I think they're just like wishing it was C. Because the definition of C is code a program starts, it, when it starts running, it searches for a function named main, and later we'll see that this function can actually have arguments, and it returns an integer as to the success or failure. So really, main is a function. And so that first line there, int, main, open paren, close paren, open curly brace, that is the definition of a function that happens to be named main. And then we have printf. Now, again, if we, if you, I don't know if you learned Python 2, but in Python 2, there was a print statement. In Python 3, there is a print function. And so here we're using a Python 3 print function. And um, C never did the statement. So C decided, as we'll talk about later, to not have any input output, any reading or writing in the language itself, but instead put them in standard libraries. And that's what this pound includes, stdio.h, is saying, okay, I'm going to do some IO here, input-output here, and so include the C input-output library. Okay, and so printf takes as its first parameter a string. The other thing you see in C is you can't use single quotes for long strings. Later we'll see single quotes, but in C, there's a major difference between single quotes and double quotes. Single, single quotes are single characters and double quotes are a character array. Not a string, character array. The other thing is things like the end of line. So in, in Python, the new line is added implicitly. In C, you have to add it explicitly. And so that's basically saying print hello world and then go to the beginning of the next line. Now, this first parameter is actually not just a string. It's a string with embedded format codes. 
that start with percent. Percent D says there is a corresponding integer number and I want you to convert that into a string and print it out. I guess I should probably just re-erase some of this. So it says answer and then a number. And so you can have more than one of these things and then they match. So that says there's an integer as another parameter. So you can have one parameter, two parameters, etc. So for beyond one parameter, like in this one, x percent dot one f, that corresponds to this first floating point number, and this percent d corresponds to the integer one. Okay, so you have these percent things. Now, we will learn that these percent things have um, a language unto themselves in chapter eight. And uh, this is basically saying, please print me a floating point number with only one digit of precision, right? So percent dot one f says print a floating point number. And then if we want a string, it's percent s, but this really Sarah here, double quote Sarah, double quote, is a character array. And it's actually not five characters, but six, because there is always a terminating zero character at the end. And so percent %s says the parameter needs to be a character array and properly terminated by an end of string indicator, which is a zero character. So, so that's this, right? <laughs> it's pretty simple, but I, we got a lot of stuff to cover here. And this is the Rosetta Stone. It's more complex than C. You have, you have more control. You're doing things that more explicitly. Um, and, and it's not doing it for you automatically. So let's take a look at a simple number input. Now you'll see that some of these things come from my, uh, my Python for Everybody class. This is the famous US floor to European floor um, elevator con converter. So we, we're gonna print something out. Now one thing about C is that you've got to declare all your variables. Python is sort of a typeless language. It's increasingly getting more typey, um, but, it's, but it's a typeless language. So we have to declare that we're gonna have two variables, USF and EUF, and they're gonna be integers. We print the statement, but the, diff the only difference there is we have to put the backslash n in, otherwise it won't automatically do that. And then we have this IO routine, again, coming from stdio.h called scanf. And its first parameter, much like printf, is actually a formatting string. And what this says is this says, read four little ways, find me a number, as long as it seems like a number, keep reading and turn that into an integer and give it back to me. And so it actually has got some scanning built into it. And, and, and it reads until it finds a non-digit and then stops and says that's the number. So it turns out in C, the way you could type a lot of different things here. We won't go into that in too much detail. We'll hold that until chapter eight. But the, the idea is it doesn't work exactly the same. Although this input in Python reads a line. Now, again, I got this little note here. If you recall, if you recall, in Python two, there was an input and a raw input. And raw input was what read a line, which I tended to use when I was teaching Python two. Input was a weird thing that had some kind of scanning thing going on and it scanned and threw stuff away and it grabbed something and it might go from to multiple lines and it was totally inconsistent and it was worse than scanf. So I was really glad when they just got rid of it in Python 3 and then they changed the name. What used to be Python 2's raw input became input in Python 3. So the old input from Python 2 is kind of like homage to scanf in C, but it's not exactly the same. And the reason it's not the same is the input in Python 2 was, was deriving the type of the data from what it encountered. So it might give you back a string, it might give you back a floating point, it might go like, oh, that's dangerous, right? And, and that's because the type of USF in Python here is determined it, 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 you can, it, it's not pre-declared, so it, it's known because we're going to convert it to an integer. And by the way, both the input and the scanf, we can write stuff that confuses it badly and causes it to blow up, but we're not, we're not worrying too much about that right now. We're just kind of getting the basics done. So we have a, we read an integer, we subtract one, we print it out, right? We read an integer, 
Oh, I forgot to say this ampersand. Call by reference and call by value. So in Python, this is coming back as a function return, so it's really easy to assign it into USF. Whereas in C, we put these parameters on a scanf call, and we have to say, oh, and by the way, I want you to change it, because ultimately, if we don't put ampersand on, it's what's called call by value, not call by reference. And ampersand USF is a way to tell C to actually give it the address of the USF variable rather than the value in the USF variable. And in that is a whole chapter that we will cover, like uh, I think four and five will be all about the ampersand and call by reference. And call by, I'm where, we're way ahead because I don't think chapters one through four would, all they ever do is mention call by reference and then say, oh, that's in the future. <laughs> so I'm gonna just say, oh, that's in the future. I will tell you that that ampersand is really important and the code doesn't work without it because it is the way that C does call by reference for simple variables like integers and floats. As you're going to see on the next slide, there's always an exception. <laughs> String input. Okay. So here we're going to, this will help my Hello Sarah thing, right? We say enter your name and then we say name input. Now the beauty is here in Python is input gives us the whole line. Okay. And then we just print hello name and you'll notice that there's like this little space that comes out automatically. So switching over to C, we have our include of the library, we have the int main, which is the, and then we have to pre-declare a character array. There is no like, make it a string. If this were Python, we could say, hey, let's make a string, but you can't. And what's even more important is you gotta tell it how long, which means that we could type too much stuff in here and blow our program up. And that's one of the difficulties of C is the fact that Arrays, including character arrays, have fixed length and they don't auto extend. There is no auto, there is no dot append in C. You can't like say, oh, name dot append. You can't do it. Python, it's an object. It's not an actual array. Python, it's an object. Name is a string object. Here, name is a character array with 100 elements. And if you put 20 in, you'll be fine. If you put 80 in, you'll be fine. If you put 101 in, it's going to blow up. Ah! Well, that's okay. That's why C is fast. We'll get to all that. We'll get to all that. So we print out a prompt and we say scanf and we say in this case percent %s give me a string and you can put a limit on it. So we're saying look only read up to a hundred characters and you'll notice there is no ampersand on name and that is because name is an array. And so when you put name in with no square brackets, no index operator, then you're passing the address of the beginning of the array. And so that is, in a sense, an ampersand. That is the location of the beginning of a 100 character array. We're gonna scan up to 100 characters into it. And so it really is roughly equivalent to the input. And then we just, again, say, per hello percent %s, and then name is the corresponding thing. And so it says, hello, Sarah. Now, a lot of what we did in the Python for Everybody is read whole lines of input. And we tended to use string parsing of those lines, like we would trim the stuff off the end and then we'd split it and do all these things. <laughs> there's, an, there's no good split in C. So we won't be doing too much of that, but it does help to understand how to read a whole line of input. So now we're gonna read something that doesn't have, a, has lots of spaces. We're gonna read the whole line and we're just gonna echo the whole line, right? Enter line, read the line, print the line. So now we're gonna have, again, we have to declare how big of a string we're willing to take, char line with a thousand characters in it. The prompt by now should be pretty easy. And we have a really weird looking percent square bracket, caret backslash n, close square bracket, 1000 s. Well, if you took Python for Everybody and you remember chapter 11, regular expressions, that should look familiar to you open bracket, caret, backslash, n, close bracket, says match any character that's not a new line. So that says scan up to the end of a line or until you hit a thousand characters. That's what percent, open square bracket, caret, backslash, n, close square bracket, 1000 s means as the first parameter to scan f. Read a whole line, but stop at a hundred, uh, stop at a thousand characters. 
And then of course, line is just the parameter and then we print that thing out. Okay, and so a lot of C programmers probably never written this particular line of code, but it gives you a sense that um, there's a lot of sort of programmability and things like regular expressions that we, you know, that Python had, well, those are kind of an old concept. Those are seven 1970s concepts. This C language had that concept in it in 1970. There's another way that's a little safer to do this. And these are the exact same thing where this command f get s. So f get s says put it into the, up to a thousand characters looking for a new line and reading from what's called standard input. So in C there are three basic files. One is the standard input, which usually is read through to, up to EOF. Standard output, which is where printf is going. And then there's a thing called standard error, which is where you send error messages that you don't just go want to go to the output. So the input and the output, like if you're going to make a program to do uppercase, you would read your input, you would uppercase it, and then send it out. But if, for example, um, you encountered a character that you didn't want to copy and you wanted to send an error, says, I'm, I'm not going to copy, you wouldn't just send it to standard output, you actually send it to standard error. When you're running um, just on a terminal, like in your command line, standard input is your keyboard, Standard output is your screen, and standard error is your screen. So you can see both the error messages and the output of the program. But if you're running sort of with redirecting input and output, you do tend to still see the error message on your screen, and it doesn't end up hidden in some standard output. But in this case, we're using fgets, which is part of the standard library, and we are saying read this from standard input. Now, you'll see in a second, when we read a file, fgets can read a file, and that third parameter is the file handle, but there are three predefined file handles in C programs, standard in, standard out, and standard error. They're all named stdin, that's their name, they're predefined constants in the C, the C standard sdio.h library. Okay, so now we're going to read a file. We do this a lot in Python. We go get a file handle, it reads it. This might fail, of course, if the file doesn't exist. Then we got a, a nice determinant loop. Remember when we talked about indeterminate loops and this for in, it's so Python-y and it's so awesome and it's like so expressive. I love it, I miss it, okay. And then uh, line.strip, which takes the new line off. Um, and so that's gonna read, you know, just reads, reads the little file, writes it out. So we, uh, we have to create a variable. We'll call it a thousand characters. We now we are st and and in, in Python we could have any length of characters in our file and it would work. But in C now we're going to have to actually say we can only handle up to a thousand characters because we've declared the line that we're going to use the line variable we're going to re read this in has a thousand. There is a equivalent to the handle. File is a type. It's defined in stdio.h star hand, which means it's a pointer to a file object. And uh, hand equals f open Romeo.txt r. So that's two character arrays, Romeo.txt and r. And actually, the open in Python is inspired by the f open in, um, in, in C. And that's because, again, uh, when they were writing Python, they were writing it in C. Why don't we take an open? And all they did was made the open in Python be a little easier. So we don't have any kind of a IO for in, so we have to write our own while loop here. So we're gonna call f get s line, give me up to a thousand characters from the file handle named hand. And f get s returns null, which is a constant that's defined in stdio.h if it reaches end of file. So this basically is a loop that says, read everything up till end of file. Very similar to this for line in hand and then we're printing it. Now, I don't have to strip it because f get s actually takes the new line that is the end of each line. So in Python, you would get double spacing if you didn't strip the new line at the end of each one of these little things, right? Each line. Whereas the, the f get s is nice enough not to give us the new line. So there we go. So a counted loop. Now that I, this honestly is not one of my favorite things in, Py in Python, but this range is a generator that's going to generate the numbers 0 through 4. For i in range, this is effectively kind of a, a, a dynamically generated set. 
and then we're going to print it. So we're going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. In C, we of course have to declare the that i is going to be an int, and the for loop has three pieces separated by semicolons. There's the initialization piece. Now, PHP and JavaScript are the exact same thing, so if this looks familiar to you, that's because you took those classes. Congratulations. So for i equals zero is the initialization. That says before the loop starts, set i to zero. Then there is the middle part is the test, whether or not the loop should can run or continue to run. It's a top tested loop. And so i less than five must be true or the loop won't run at all. But given that i is zero at the beginning, it's less than five, so it's gonna run at least once. And then each time through the loop at the bottom, after the loop is run, we're gonna add one to i with a i plus plus, a post increment operator. And again, that line of code, PHP, JavaScript, Java all look the same, except PHP has dollar signs for variable prefixes, which yeah, bothers me, but it is what it is. And of course we have a, a block, curly brace, open curly brace and close curly brace denote the block. And then we simply print the variable out and both, both bits of code produce the exact same output. So if we get a little bit trickier, we're going to do a, uh, take an example from my Python for Everybody class and look at the max and min. And because we need to prime the loop, we're going to set our max val to none and the min val to none. And we're gonna do an, a middle tested infinite loop while true, we're gonna read the input line, each line, like five, two, nine. We're gonna strip it just because. We're gonna check to see if it's the string done. If it is, we're gonna break out of the loop, right? And then we're gonna convert it to an integer. And we're gonna check to see if max val is none or the val value we read is greater than max val. We're gonna rem remember it. And if min val is none or the value we just read is less than min val, we're gonna remember it. And when the loop finally reads all the way through, we're gonna print out the maximum and the minimum. So now we see the C version of this. And <clears throat> so we, we have some, our include files at the beginning to kind of prime our libraries. We don't have a none type, right? So we're going to create a logical. And in C, logical true is, anything other than zero. Zero is false and everything else is what we call truthy. So I'm gonna just call, make a variable called first and it's gonna have a value of one when we're on the first line. And so that way I'll know when I'm seeing the first value. And so then I'm gonna have the value, the maximum value in a line of characters that's a thousand long as sort of my buffer. And I'm gonna write a basic while loop to read through standard input until reading a line at a time until I get a null. And that means EOF. Now, of course, it's unsafe. I'm just mostly using get s to reinforce to you that you're not supposed to use it. So this is gonna be a loop that's gonna read all the lines. If we do stir comp, now stir comp is the string comparison. Uh, in, this, in, the, in the string.h library, it is a way to do a, for a whole string, because remember, strings are arrays of characters. So it actually has to scan both arrays, looking for greater than or equal to greater than, less than, etc. So in one routine, you can compare two whole strings, two arrays, and it'll tell you if it's greater than, if the first one is greater than the second one, it gives you a one back. If the first one is less than the second one, it gives you a negative one back. And if the first one is equal to the second one, it gives you zero back. And so this is a way to do the same kind of string equality, except it's character array equality in this particular case. And we're gonna break if it's not there. And then if it is there, we're gonna convert it to an integer using a to i, and that comes from the string.h library. And basically, if um, we're on the first one, or the current value we just read is greater than maxval, we're gonna grab max, the current value as maxval if we're on the first one, or if the current value is less than minval, we're going to grab that as well. And then we mark first as zero so that we only do that first bit one time through the loop. We go through, and then we say done, it exits the loop, and we can print the maximum and the minimum. So it's pretty equivalent. So a little more C-ish version of that, a, a, a good C programmer would not use uh, A to I. A good C programmer would use scanf. So this is pretty much the same code, except we're using scanf with a percent %d format input format and scanning into the val integer variable and using ampersand to indicate that it's called by reference and to replace the current val, and then the rest of it's the same, right? If uh, if it's the first one or we've got a larger one, we keep it. 
If it's the first one or we got a smaller one, we keep that one as well. We loop through and it all goes. Now, one thing that if we're using Scanf, as I mentioned before, Scanf doesn't sort of stop at the end of lines. It keeps on going. And so the if I, if I have 5, 2, and 9, and again, we have to use Control D or EOF here to, to finish this, or we have to 5, space 2, 5, uh, space 9, and then EOF, it, it does the same because Scanf is just looking for an integer. It start, it's really, it's algorithm. We'll see this in chapter eight, but the, the thing that it does, it's like, get me an integer, which means throw away stuff that's not an integer. So um, away you go. So that's a slightly more c version of uh, this min-max using uh, scanf. And it doesn't suffer from the problem of using uh, get us and having to worry about the size of the arrays, the character arrays. Here's a guessing game. That's one of my favorite applications. So we have an infinite loop, the ultimate non-determinant loop, a loop that you got to examine to know that it's going to finish. And in this particular one, we're just looping to EOF. You're using try and accept. Why? Because line doesn't give you any return indication that it's hit into file. So we just have to like have it blow up and then do an accept and then jump out. Oh well. So we throw away the new line and then we convert the line to an integer and we say if guess is 42 nice work and then break which gets out of the loop the break affects the loop not the if and then lf guess less than 42 too low else print too high so this is a classic multi-way if we're going to have an if you can have it's kind of as many lfs as you want dot 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 and then an else we can do the same thing in c uh, we're going to use the scanf pattern, waiting till we uh, see EOF. Um, if the guess is 42, um, we print nice work and then break. Now we have to have curly braces here because that is a two statement block. And so we, if you're having more than one statement, you've got to do uh, curly braces. And then else, this else matches up with that if. Else if guess less than 42, print F. Now, Modern programmers would tend to put curly braces even though this is only one line, but this printf is the statement connected to the if. And it does not need curly braces because what comes after an if is a statement or block of statements with curly braces. And the same is true of this else. The printf is the single statement. So you would you'd not see curly braces here. And I I'm I would write this with curly braces, but because the authors of the book are really very succinct. They tend to not put curly braces in, so I'm calling your attention to that. Now, a really important thing to call your attention to is the difference between else, space, if, and l if. Now, the high level is what we're doing in C is not really a multi-way if. What we're doing in Python is truly a multi-way if. This if and l if and else are really part of the same block of code. But this else if is two keywords. And so if you look at the, the, the first if, the first if has one block of code, which is the printf nice work and the break. And then the else clause of the first if is this entire block of code here, which is if guess less than 42, printf, yada, yada, and then another else. And so this is a block. So this is a block if, and in the else clause, there is another block if. And so if you look at this, really the indentation of this stuff ought to be in, in this, like the else if part and the else, that indentation should be further in. Now by convention, we don't de-indent, we don't add that indentation, even though it's technically correct, because this is an else, and then there's one statement, and that statement is the if, okay? And so it's, it, we use this idiomatically all the time. It looks like a multi-way if, else, if, else, but it's not. It's actually a further and further deeply nested else if, an else with an if inside the else, and then another else with an if inside the else. We just don't indent it. We indent it by convention as if it were a multi-way if. You don't need to know this precisely when you are writing code, but I just want to point that out in case, like, in the back of your mind, you're like, 
why does Python call it LF, which is one reserved word, and why does C not have an LF, but instead has an LSIF? I think when the Guido invented Python, he said, look, that's a cool convention. Let's make it actually part of the language rather than a idiomatic use of the language. Okay, enough of that, enough of that. Okay, calling by value functions. This is pretty easy, right? There's no def keyword. Um, you have the return value, the name of the function, and the parameters. And then, of course, before the curly braces, you have to have the type of the parameters. Those are not the type of the variables in the function. Those are the type of the parameters. In Python, you don't need to tell it what type they are. Python is kind of a flexible typeless language. The type of a variable goes right along with it. Any, you could be inside my mult and say, what kind of a thing is A? And then A could be an integer. It could be a float. It could be whatever. It could be a string, right? Because that's an object, and an object can have a type, whereas A is just a number, and you have to tell it in C, ah, that number that's coming in, it is an integer. And if someone miscalls it in C, like put 6.0 here, it just blows up, doesn't work right. I mean, it might do something, it's just unexpected, right? So there's no cleverness. Now, there might be some checking. You might get a compiler warning that says, how come it's an integer here and it's a floating point here. That will be dangerous, but it won't fix it for you and it doesn't automatically convert it. Whereas if you did this in Python, it would automatically convert. So you have a far greater responsibility to match your types up in C. Uh, things like return statement, pretty much functions the same. That was, you know, the Python return statement is an imitation of the C return statement. You do have to declare your variable types that are going to be used temporary inside the function. Scope-wise, right, this C is not outside. We will see later when we get to the functions chapter about external values and static values, etc. But the default scoping is that any variable that you declare inside of a function only lives inside the function. There is no A, B, or C in the main code. Any, and that's the same as how Python works. This section here on shouting is, uh, again, an example from Python for Everybody. So if you look at how to shout, you open a file, you loop through all of it until end of file, you take the line, you strip the white space, and then you convert it to uppercase, and you get your file output. Now, <coughs> line is a string object that has a strip method that also has an upper method, and it's all in there. You got none of that. You don't have a string object in C. So we're going to, this is from a, pretty much the same, we're going to read, open a file, and then we're going to read it until end of file. But then, instead of just saying upper, we have to actually loop through the character array. For i equals zero, i less than sterling line, so there's like six characters, so we're going to go through from zero to five. Zero based arrays, right? i plus plus. And then we're going to print the character, that just puts a single character to output, and then call the two upper function. The two upper function comes from uh, ctype.h, and then we're going to pass a character. Two upper does not do it to a string. Upper in Python does it to a string. Two upper takes a character, and that's why we have to separately uppercase every single character in this loop. Okay, and so this just sort of celebrates or emphasizes this notion that when you're working with strings, you just have lots more responsibility in C because they're character arrays. Not only do you have to loop through looking for the end of it, you also have to do things like make sure that you don't overuse it. You've got to make sure that you allocate enough data. Okay? So that is shouting. And the other thing to note here is you'll notice the lack of curly braces again. The indenting here is right, but the lack of curly braces is totally right as well, even though most programmers like me if you're going on to separate lines, I in insert what you'd call redundant and unnecessarily curly braces just to help myself and other programmers out when they read this code. Let's do concatenation. Simple enough in C. Why? Because we have string objects, right? So in C, we grab two strings. We read one. We read the second. And we concatenate them with a plus, And then we're going to put plus, quote, ampersand, quote, with the spaces. And then we print that out. Pretty simple, right? Well. In C, we have to decide the maximum length of the first string, the maximum length of the second string, and the maximum length of a concatenated string, which is the size of the first plus the size of the second, plus three for the thing we're going to concatenate, right? Just 
kind of obsessively bothering us with this. So we read the 100 characters of the first string, 100 characters of the second string, and then we're going to take and copy the first string into the concat. And that just takes all the characters, Kernigan plus a backslash zero plus an end of string character, copies that into the concat. Then we're going to call stircat. Stir copy and stircat come from the string library. Okay. We're going to concatenate the character ray space ampersand space. So that's three more added to concat and moving the end character. We got to keep terminating that string. Got to terminate the string with the with the backslash zero end character. Then we concatenate the second one, which again character by character, it's kind of appending to this thing. Dot dot dot. Put a new line, put an end character, backslash zero. Backslash zero and new line, backslash n, are very different things. Backslash zero is the character that means end of string, and backslash n means move to the beginning. You can have more characters after backslash n. So we concatenate them and then we print them all out. And so this is just, again, sort of the symbolism or the just a re emphasis of this notion that without string objects, we take a lot more responsibility. And that shows up in this one. And this is really just like, wow, I want to strip the characters off the right side of a string. Can we do that? So I'm going to print out a dash followed by the string after our strip. And so you see the characters have been removed. Okay. One line of code in Python. Here we go. So I'm going to create this string that's hello world with the spaces at the beginning and the end. And this little uh, S1 open bracket, close bracket, as long as you're assigning it to a constant, the compiler will figure out how much space is needed. So however long that is, I don't have to tell it that that's 26 characters or whatever it is, because it just looks at quote space, blah, blah, hello world. It says, oh, that's 26 characters. And so it puts 26 in here for us automatically. Then... We have to declare pi r strip, which is the function we're going to write, as returning nothing. So the void is a quick was a feature that was quickly added be after 1978, so that if your function did not return something, you would declare it a void. That void is like a non-fruitful function. In Python, we talk about fruitful and non-fruitful functions. Fruitful functions send things back with the return. Non-fruitful do not. Void is the way to say it's a non-fruitful function, which means it's like just a subroutine. It's going to do all of its work. So we're going to have this string, which is an array, a string array, and we're going to pass, it gets passed by reference because it's an array. So pi r strip, pass r, uh, the s1 variable, and then we're going to print the whole thing out. So let's take a look. Now, we are being passed a variable here in pi r strip, and it is a character array. Now, the thing is, we're not allocating it. It's a parameter. It's been allocated. We don't know if it's 25 or 25,000. But it doesn't matter because we're going to assume it's properly formed and then we're going to stop at the blank at the at the uh, backslash zero the end of string indicator so we don't need to know here we just need to know where to start and that's what we're being told where the start of this character array is in the memory create some variables for i equals zero comma j equals zero the comma operator is really cool it's kind of like a uh, another statement separator so that you in the four you can have your three pieces Right? And then you can have i equals 0, comma j equals 0. Now you've got two statements in the initialization part. Because we want to start both i and j at 0. And we're going to go until we get to the, the length of the string, minus 1, and then we're going to add 1 to it. And then what we're going to do is we are going to use j. So we're going to, i is going to go through the line, right? Go through the line. And j is going to go through the non-blank part of the line. So when it's all done, i and j might be at the same place, or i might be at the end of the line, and j is at the end of the last non-blank character. So j is the last non-blank character. So we're checking to see if the character we're looking at is a new line, a tab, or a blank. And if it is, we don't move j forward. And if it's not, we do move j forward. And then we basically say if j plus 1 is less than the length of the input string, we're going to set imp j plus 1 to be the end of character. So we're actually truncating it, right? So, so you know, if there's blanks, 
I and J will go like this, but then if there's blanks, the I will end up farther and the J will end up at the last non-blank character, but then we have to go one beyond it to put the marker of the end of the string and then boom, all that space is gone. So that's how we write R strip in and C. So of course, what are we going to do next? L strip. So we're going to strip the characters from the left, which of course means, let's get the pen working here, we're going to get rid of the characters at the beginning of the line. Actually, we're going to do it a little bit differently here. So what we did in the previous one was um, we had I running through the array, and then we had J stopping at the last non-blank character, and then we put the end marker here, which truncated the string. That's not what we're going to do here. What we're going to do is we're going to move I through the string, but we're only going to move, and then we're going to copy whatever's in I to whatever's in J, if, and J is only going to move forward once we see and copy a character. So we're going to copy the these characters back to the beginning. So J is only going to, I is going to move forward inexorably to the end of the string, and J is only going to move forward when we have copied non-blank characters. So we're rewriting this string in place. Okay? So again, J, J and I start together, I goes through the string, but J stays at zero until it encounters a non-blank character and copies it, and then it adds it to one and then copies. Okay? And as soon as we find a non-blank character, then all the rest of it, so you want these blanks to be copied as well, right? So let's see how that works. The main program is pretty much the same. The definition of the function is pretty much the same. We start with a found variable that we're going to set to false as zero. And then we're going to set i and j to zero, run up through sterlen imp minus one, i plus plus. And so we're going to use is space, which is out of ctype.h. If we have not yet found a non-blank character, because as soon as we find a non-blank character, we want to copy all the rest of the characters without, without anything, including the trailing blanks. Okay. If it's not found and it's a space, we're going to continue, which means that I is going to move forward until it finds a non-blank character. So all these spaces that are before the H are continue, run this continue code. So it's really I is moving and J is staying. Then as soon as we find a non-blank character, if I is J return, that meant that we went all the way through the line and there was no, no beginnings of the blank. So if, if I and J, if, actually no, if, if the first character is non-blank, I and J move up one, we might as well quit. So if I and J are moving together, then we've got rid of all the blanks. There were no blanks to get rid of. But then we say found equals one, and then we say imp J plus plus, which means we store in the Jth place, and then we add one to J, right, and equals imp I. So we're copying the characters from that point forward back and then J is moving forward and I is moving forward and the copy is happening. And when it's all said and done, we have copied every character except the, the, end, of, the end of string character. So we say imp and add, so plus plus J says add one to J, use it in the index and then store it. So that goes one past it. Again, if you walk through all this and you do it all by hand, you will see that that's going to work. And again, the point of this is not so much for you to write left strip in C, but to understand that when you're dealing with character arrays with line end convention, uh, with string end conventions that are embedded in the string versus objects that we use in Python, it's a very different way of thinking. It's a very different way of thinking. And so our last example is going back and doing concatenation again, but this time focusing on dynamic memory. And, and up to now, I've been obsessed with saying they're not strings, they're character arrays, and you have to know their size before you start. 
Now, when we get more advanced, chapter five, chapter six, and on, we will see that there are dynamic memory mechanisms inside of C, and that's actually how we build things like a dictionary or a string class. And so there's this function. Let me get the pen back up. I think there's the pen, yeah. There's this function called calloc. The calling sequence is, you know what? I need some number of characters. Operating system, you have some memory. You bring that to me, give it to me, and tell me where you put it. And I will use it. I will be good. I won't go outside of it. You just give it to me, and then I'm going to use it. And so we're going to just do the same thing. We're going to concatenate two strings together and print them out. So I'm not going to use dynamic memory for first or second. I'm just going to read them just like we did before. But then I'm going to compute how much space we need to do the concatenation. I'm going to add the length of the first string, the length of the space ampersand space, which is three, the length of the second string, and then another character to store the backslash zero. So at the end of the string, you got to put that marker. Always have to put the marker. So we're going to need with Kernighan plus ampersand Richie, we're going to need 20 characters. The, the concatenated string is 19 characters, but we're really going to need 20 characters. So we're going to say, hey, operating system, I need 20 characters and give me back a location. Now that location is of type char star, and that's called a pointer to a character. Now a pointer to a character and an array of characters are the same thing, and the bracket is just an offset from a location that's the beginning of the array. So when we're done, we have this concat, which really functions, you know, char star concat, not concat, that's a single character. A star concat is to a pointer to the beginning of an array of characters, right? And so char star concat, and then calloc, c alloc, gives us this memory, and in this case, it gives us 20 characters. And then we just copy the first string in, copy the ampersand in, and copy the second string in. And at that point, concat is 19 characters long, but has been allocated 20 characters, and we simply print it out. And you'll notice we're using concat exactly the way we would in the previous example where we made concat a character array. Now, the one thing that we have to remember to do once we have borrowed this memory from the operating system is we have to give it back. And we call a function called free. And we give it the pointer that we used. And they, they said, here's your space. And then you give that pointer back and they go like, I'm done with this space. You can give it to somebody else. And so that's what you have to do. We're going to cover dynamic memory a lot in the rest of the courses. And, and really, when it's all said and done, dynamic memory is the essence of what C is all about. And that's how Python implements dictionaries using dynamic memory. Python implements string objects with dynamic memory. So we'll get to all that. Whew, that's a lot of Rosetta Stone. We talked about input output. We talked about looping. We talked about reading a file. We've talked about strings, which are really character arrays. We've talked about um, float. We talked about dynamic memory. And later, 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 we're going to learn a lot. And chapters five and six are the crazy chapters, but we're going to play with how would, Py how would we implement some of the things that Python strings, lists, and dictionaries handle. You, I've seen there's a little foreshadowing because we'll, we saw strips, right? R strip and L strip. And before this course is over, we're going to come back and get inside the mind of what it would take to build Python using the C language. So we'll see how alloc, structures, pointers, etc., character arrays can be used to build string object, list object, and dict object. And that to me is the learning objective of this course is not so much how to code C because it's your job, but what in C is necessary to make a higher level language like Python or JavaScript or Java or C Sharp work. And we'll get to that before the end of the course. It is a long course. Um, and again, this was a long lecture. This is, takes some time to absorb. And, and just zooming through this, you, you, you achieve nothing if you just do the homework without understanding it. So take your time. I put the lines in this lecture, the lines of code, are there very much on purpose. Every single one is trying to teach something. So I hope you'll take the time to learn all this material.
Cheers. <laughs>